Um, our next presentation is by Jeff Munns. And um, Jeff is from the University of Western Sydney. And like John Smythe, um, Jeff's research is something that I've been you know, reading for many years. Jeff and I actually met <laughs> a few years back um, en route to New Orleans. We'd been stuck up the back of a, a plane where there were no windows and you know, crying children and all that sort of stuff. But we had a wonderful conversation, uh, him and his wife and I. And uh, yes, it was, oh, we were so tired because it was on the way there. But um, yeah, so Jeff's at uh, University of Western Sydney. He's had 25 years of experience in schools. Um, and a lot of Jeff's work is around working in disadvantaged school contexts um, and about how to make classrooms and schools more engaging um, for poor students or um, students, as John says, put at a disadvantage. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Munns. Hi, everyone. So it's that um, after lunch session, isn't it? And um, I, I kind of reiterate what um, others have said before me, that um, a lot of us seem as though we're singing from the same song sheet here, which is, uh, which I think is, is really good in a way. Um, so as I was listening to presentations by the people at Marylands East and John and other people, I was hearing the, the words like trust, self-regulation, autonomy, challenging compliance, and I was kind of ticking them all off. Um, I've got nothing on bananas, I have to say. Um, but anyway, what I hope to do is just kind of offer a different perspective, um, perhaps add something to, to what has already been done in the really important work around engagement. So it's apologies to Dickens, tale of two engaged classrooms, it was the best of times. Let me take you into a classroom. As I walk through the door, the first thing I notice is that it is a large room and the space is open. There are not enough tables and chairs for each student so that there are not designated spaces. Students make decisions about where they will learn. All the walls in the classrooms have charts that are strongly focused on learning. Those at the front of the room have a specific concentration on student self-assessment and peer assessment. Their headings include what do I need to learn next in writing? What do you need to improve after today's learning? How did you feel today when you learned something new? And what type of learner am I? On each chart, post-it notes show students' reflections on their learning. One girl has written on the fourth of these charts, visualising helps me to turn my brain because visualising is great for me. Comments like this are typical. Learning experiences begin with the teacher, Brooke, leading a series of teacher-led conversations about the tasks, the processes and the criteria. When she has finished, students make decisions about their next steps. They select cards of the red, yellow or green traffic lights, and these indicate to the teacher that they don't understand, they might need some help or they're good to go. Work starts and the teacher is able to work in a concentrated way with the students who most need her. The others have indicated that they are focused and learning. Behaviour is not an issue. It is not mentioned at any time throughout the session and all conversations are about learning. Trust, there's that word, and self-regulation, there's the other one, are words that spring to mind and remain with me throughout the morning. There are many examples of focused and self-regulated learning during the morning. The following two examples provide strong insights into how the classroom operates. The first is about the reflection booth. I love it. During the session, two boys, unannounced and almost unnoticed, have made a decision to walk to a designated space at the back of the room. They pick up an iPad and film each other's reflection about the morning's learning. They are fluent reflectors and work together to capture a record of their understanding in the reflection booth. The teacher's mentor writes about this.
Tough time? The second example is about the whole class shared reflections on learning. After the session, the class reconvenes for further conversations about their achievement and progress. Another graphic representation, the Bump It Up chart, has broken down the current learning outcome into a series of ascending steps with arrows describing the criteria to be reached. And students are able to place themselves along this continuum. There is no stigma about doing this and it is accepted as what happens in the classroom. As the students explain during an interview, the arrows help to show the levels and it's good to talk about the learning because we learn more, get better, the whole class gets better. This is important. So this is the classroom context um, and this is actually from a recently uh, published uh, chapter in a book on integrative learning and in the book I can tell the story and, and people are invited to predict um, the context and the age of the kids but you can see this is the classroom context. Um, it's an outer urban um, community in Sydney and you can see the kind of learners um, that, are, that turn up every day at the school. Very, it's a school close to John's school at Maryland that we heard about yesterday and the terrific stuff that they've been doing there. The teacher um, is in a second year of teaching um, and she's working in, in a project which we call the Fair Go Bridges Project, which is action research utilising our, our Fair Go um, student engagement framework and, and there's a mentoring model and it's a, it's a, it's a research project, project uh, co-researching, um, working with teachers which has involved um, up to 24 schools over a three year period and we're represented by one of the cooperating schools here, uh, Blair Mount Public School. I've got a really big contingent of executive and uh, I'm trying to see them up the back there somewhere. Yeah, there they are. Um, and they've done some outstanding work on, on uh, student engagement across the whole of their school. So why is this context important in my view? Well, the first thing I think is important about it is that, that whole idea that, of reflective learning from the very earliest uh, years. Um, and the second thing is kind of picking up on what Andrew was talking about yesterday, the whole notion of kind of mastery, personal best as opposed to performance. And then something that we've really felt was important, the whole notion of, of reflection and student self-assessment are really important for engaged learners and, and, and we think especially important for the kind of learners that we're interested in, in low SES communities. We're often, you know, there's a, there's a fallback position in controlling and... and um, you know, preparing for tests. So our program of research into student engagement has, has gone through a number of phases and I'll touch on briefly on those in, in the time that I have. Um, we started off in some of the poorer schools in southwestern Sydney and we, we thought about what would good teaching look like in those schools. We developed a, pro, a framework around student engagement. We then went to a, a, an ARC funded project where we case studied 30 outstanding exemplary teachers of students in poverty using what we call the MEE framework. And then the last part is, is the story that, one of the stories that you've just heard in the Fairgo Bridges uh, project. Um, and that project <laughs> we think has been really important because we've, we've encouraged teachers that we work with to, to understand the, the, the idea of student engagement, but then we've given them that trust to go and make changes in their classroom. And a really exciting thing about that our third Fairgo Fairgo Bridges project is that many times teachers have come up with ideas that we hadn't thought about as researchers. And that's been, that's been really exciting for us. So our framework for student engagement, here the time goes quickly, doesn't it? Um, are you sure it's set right? I've been not waste time then, had I? But we have a framework which, is, which talks about um, M, motivation, and, and that has drawn on the work of uh, Andrew Martin, um, you know, the kind of thoughts and behaviours that are adaptive for motivation and engagement. Then there's been a, what we call small e engagement, a classroom pedagogy focus, and, and we, where we really think about the pedagog pedagogical conditions that we can bring about in a classroom to enhance student engagement. And we also have a notion of big E engagement. 
And the, the framing looks something <coughs> like this, where you can see the small M, the small E, and they're contributing to what we call big E engagement. And um, I, I haven't got time to go into this frame in detail, because I want to just talk a little bit about the, the small E stuff. Um, but in the, in the pack you have, there are some publications coming out of our research, and you can, you can chase that down if you're interested. Um, but about small E engagement, which is that, you know, this, this stuff here on the, on the right-hand side, um, and a little bit about how that came about, um, we were working in schools, as I said before, in, in South West and Sydney, many schools, extremely low SES schools, and, and, um, and we really had to go about in working with our teachers in our action research project about redefining student engagement. And, and that involved us in problematising student compliance. And that, that was a really interesting and difficult task for, for all of us because many of the... Many of the teachers we were working with would give their back teeth to have, you know, perfectly controlled and compliant kids. But, but we worked with them in, in a conversation that said, you know, that's an outcome that holds no guarantees for, for improved outcomes. We wanted good kids. Of course we wanted good kids, but we wanted good kids who were compliant in the right kinds of activities that were happening in the classroom. We're also really aware of, of how classroom practices can be shaped by... by practices of resistance and compliance and, and very aware with the research which consistently shows that many kids in, in those kind of environments can comply with um, low level tasks and, and resist high level tasks. And, and that process often convinces some teachers that they can only do certain things in the classroom and we wanted to challenge that. So we're interested in substan substantive um, student engagement not procedural stuff. So, you know, substantive, there's a psychological investment. Procedural, you're doing stuff that the teacher asks you to do. And we're, up, we're interested in that on a short-term and a long-term basis. And our definition of engagement falls, that, that came out of this project, falls completely in line with the literature with a, with a couple of um, subtle changes. Um, we, we talk about small e engagement <coughs> as the coming together of the cognitive, the effective and the operative thinking hard, feeling good, operative, working to be better learners. Um, our notion of bigger engagement is that um, it's, it's a notion that school is for me, school is a, is a place that works for me. Many examples of this in this seminar conference. Um, and education is a resource that I can employ in my current and future schooling. And we, and we argued that those things were embedded, that, that those things are playing out together if we can get our classroom conditions right. Our framework looks at um, the experiences in the middle and, and teachers deliberately planning engaging experiences which have an interplay of that co cognitive, <coughs> effective and operative. And what I, meant to, what I should have said about that is that engagement under this definition is multifaceted. If we don't have them all into play, we don't have engagement by our definitions. So we've got to experience heart in the middle, high effective, high cognitive, high operative. And then we've got an outside processes which we call the inside of classroom. And that's about kind of the, developing the, the um, community of reflection and, and um, student self and peer assessment some of the examples that were seen in, in Brooks' classroom. And, and a really important part of, of our work is, is the notion that um, if we get the pedagogy right and, and we get the relationship of engagement right, um, you know, we don't see engagement as, as something that kids are doing, but we see it as a kind of an interplay of the teacher's pedagogy and their relationship with what's happening with the kids. Engagement is something that's happening inside kids' heads. It's not a set of tasks that kids are doing. And we, and we, we argue as well that, that it's playing out through these uh, engaging messages around knowledge, ability, control, place and voice. Um, many people who work in educationally disadvantaged schools will, will be familiar with the opposite, you know? Why am I doing this? I can't do this. I ain't going to do that. I'm just a kid from... Mount Druid, I'm just a kid from the housing estate. Or we, we, don't, we do stuff because the teacher tells us <coughs> to do it. 
And, and we, we knew that historically for some kids in some schools, those were the kind of disengaging messages that they were receiving. And we wanted to turn those around through the pedagogical relationship that, that was being developed with, between the kids and the teachers. I'm sure that clock's going quicker than 60 <laughs> seconds a minute. What can you do? Okay, the second classroom in five minutes, 38 seconds. I picked a quote in introducing this um, from Martin's class. It kind of feels easy, even though it's hard. And um, gee, it was almost like the, the quote from, um, what was the little guy's name in the last presentation? Isaiah, yeah. And, and Martin also was working in our project, and, and that's the, his um, school uh, context. A different kind of a context, a bit further out in, in Sydney, and it was one of those those um, housing estates where there kind of tends to be a lot of intergenerational um, kind of poverty. And Martin talks about the classroom changes and he talks about expectations and, and, he, and he talks about how these kids had been shaped in their schooling around ideas of compliance and behaviour and how when they, when they started to get the kids to reflect on their learning all they were talking about was behaviour and not on what they were achieving or could achieve. And the classroom changes that, that were brought about in, in Martin's classroom, you know, we have to stress are not tricks to be easily dropped into any classroom. We've always believed in our research of the classroom as a long project. Um, you know, teachers working in a way that, that's more concerned with what happens in December than what happens in February. You know, big plans for kids, big changes for kids. And, and what they were really interested in was changing the conversation in the classroom and focusing on learning over behaviour. In one of the presentations yesterday afternoon after um, Bruce, and, Bruce and Joe talked about, you know, moving the classroom, moving the school from a a welfare community to a learning community. And, and this, this classroom was really interested in moving from a kind of a welfare classroom to a behaviour classroom because they really did have some challenging kids. And this is Nicole, the mentor, because Martin was working with one of the mentors from our previous project. And she talks about modelling it and she talks about, you know, being open with the kids. Writing journal entries on the board you know, treating reflection as a text almost, so that the kids kind of understood, you know, what was, asked, what was being asked of them. And the breakthrough came by the time that they visually represented learning as a continuum. And I, I have to stress that, that what I want to say here and what I'm sharing is that the, the most important part in this process in this classroom was the student reflection. Um, but they differentiated learning and they broke the learning down into kids speak and, and they put kids onto, help kids put themselves onto a continuum and I, I thought when they started to do this and I said earlier that, that we kind of trust teachers to, to take our ideas and, and to play with them in a research sense and be, you know, be a co-researching, researchally disposed teacher in the words of um, our Bob Lingard. Um, <coughs> And we thought it was risky because they had kids who were, who were quite a low academic standard and those kids were, were quite, were not happy at school, many of them. But they broke it down, they focused on the idea that this was a journey that everybody had to go on. And all students had to travel in and some just had been down further down the track. And one kid said to me in an interview, you know, it's just like Mario. You know, you start at the bottom and you work your way up. And... And Martin talks about that and, and I think such an important part of his work, oh, I hate that clock, um, important part of his work is, was showing them that they could all go on the journey um, and they bought it, as he said, and, and said, let me start. About the two classrooms and just something about behaviour, which, you know, when we started off in our project, we were never a project about behaviour. We were always a project about engagement. And, you know, when we think about Brooks' year one students, you know, they were just starting off. They, they didn't have much of 
much time to kind of work out what, what school was like. They hadn't kind of learnt to do the rules of school. And, and so, you know, Brooke's, Brooke's journey that she put them on was, was a, you know, in some ways kind of an easier journey. Um, but Martin's year five, six kids, behaviour had become very much part of their narrative. They'd been sorted, they'd been labelled, they'd responded. And, you know, they were either fallen into those patterns that we heard about in the last presentation. You know, they've been the good kids who have kind of suffered in classes who, where behaviour by some kids kind of dominates the space pedagogically, physically, emotionally, um, or they're just kind of the invisible kids in between. And it, this quote is a quote for an interview from one of the more difficult kids, you know, and, and you know, I use the word difficult and it's not fair on the kid, you know, but you know what I mean. He was a kid who, who through his um, schooling career, had exhibited quite challenging behaviours. And he talked, and he, this kid had made, you know, not a, not a complete miraculous transformation, it's much more complex than that. But he'd learnt that, um, that what it was happening with him in the classroom was closely relied on, you know, kind of his self-concept of himself as a learner. And he talked about how, you know, he just used to get sent out and stay, sit outside the deputy's, deputy's office. And, and Martin goes on to talk a little bit more about this. And, and one of the things that we've, we've really thought about a lot in our research is that um, when the classroom changes, when the classroom opens up, um, it opens up for everybody. And I think that's such an important thing because sometimes in classrooms where the space has been dominated by some kids, that, that the other kids are just not having a good time either, you know? They might be getting good reports and, and not getting into trouble, but they're not having a great time because the pedagogical space is not open for them. And, and what Martin was able to achieve in, in this focus around learning relentless focus around learning was, was to kind of open it up for everybody. And I think that's such an important point. Wow, I'm in a question time. Okay, so some common key strategic issues to finish. I'm on the last lap, Linda. First of all, students can get it. And, you know, we've, we've had that in, in some of the other presentations. And, you know, some quotes from Brooke's class um, to talk about how you know, when the teacher has serious conversations with kids about learning and reflection and what's important, it becomes part of their discursive makeup, if you like. Um, and I won't read them all, but they're just great, aren't they? I'm good at writing, it's now part of me. We're making the decisions ourselves. It's important to make our own decision. Six-year-olds, and then, of course, you can look back on kindy and say, ah, kinder was boring, now we learn big words, important stuff. In Martin's class, they're a bit older and they've, they've got a little bit more to say about what's happening in their classroom. Fun. He, he might give us hard work, but he makes it fun. So that's kind of the, the definition of engagement. Other teachers don't help us as much and they don't get it. He's different from the other teachers because he'll do fun work and other teachers will do mostly worksheets and we just copy and stuff. Secondly, relentless focus on learning from both of those teachers, engaged learning, interplay of cognitive, effective and operative. And if that doesn't come into place, then, then there's a good chance that the outcomes will be pulled down or unequally distributed. And both classrooms problematise compliance and achieved improved behaviour by, through not focusing on control. Strategies for reflection, they all thought very seriously about what, how they would implement reflection. I wouldn't necessarily say that you would take from this presentation that you would do that stuff, but they thought about what they were gonna do for reflection in their context. And they focused on both skills and processes and a bigger picture of engaged learning. You know, questions like, if you were the teacher today, how would you have taught this reading lesson? 
write a memo to your mum about the three most important things you learnt today and the three things you want to learn tomorrow. You know, stuff like that. And the last thing is about buying into expectations, and I am on the, the last slide. Um, and, and I thought this is important because people have talked about expectations in this, in this, um, in this uh, seminar. And, and you can see from this little discussion between Martin and Nicole, his mentor, um, you know, we often talk about teachers having high expectations. But, but what they're talking about here is how they were helping the kids have high expectations of themselves. And, you know, Nicole says, you know, that was the hard work. They actually believe, and it's true, that they might, that they are meant to learn and achieve. <coughs> and Martin, any teacher could tell them that, but until they believe in it themselves, there's no difference. There's no change for them. And, and I couldn't sum it up any better, the six-year-old in Brooks' class. It's good to talk about the learning because we learn more, get better. The whole class gets better. This is important. Thank you.